What's going on guys? My name is Tommy. Welcome back to the channel. Today, your Pathfinder 2nd Edition preview content rolls right on. Today, the Feats of Skill blog is on the chopping block. You want skill feats? We've got them. Hey, if you guys are liking what you're seeing, hit that like button, hit that subscribe button. Real quick, this episode of your Pathfinder 2nd Edition preview content was brought to you in part by Mr. Tomiya Nagase. My friend, Thank you so much for your time and support. Let's dive in. Okay, so earlier in the week, we talked about how skills would work in Pathfinder. And if you missed that, hey, real quick, follow this card right up here. It's definitely a huge overhaul. We're replacing the myriad of points we can assign with proficiency. A lot of skills are merging together. But the other big change that we haven't seen a lot of up until now is that we will have skill feats. Quote, Every character gets at least 10 skill feats, one at every even numbered level, though rogues get 20. And you can always take a skill feat instead of a general feat. At their most basic level, skill feats allow you to customize how you use skills in the game, from combat tricks to social exploits, from risk-averse failure prevention to high-risk heroism. If you'd ever rather just have more trained skills than special techniques with the skills you already have, you can always take the skill training skill feat to do just that, which seems super good to me because more options, more things I can do competently when we're not stabbing people in the face, taking their stuff and selling it to literally the first person who will buy it off us, sounds great to me. Now the first big thing that comes up in the blog today, and a big thing it really is, is this thing called assurance. Quote, some skill feats are shared across multiple skills. One that will stand out to risk averse players, like yours truly, is assurance which allows you to achieve a result of 10, 15, 20, or even 30, depending on your proficiency rank, without rolling. The blog notes that if you're taking a huge penalty or being forced to roll multiple times and use the lowest result, you can use assurance to always get the listed result. So yeah, right there, we see that taking 10 and taking 20 are coming back with a vengeance in Pathfinder 2nd Edition for our skills, and even more so, we can take 30 now. Though, of course, we wouldn't be necessarily tacking on the modifiers after taking the 20 like one would in Pathfinder 1st Edition and farther back. But this is a baseline that assures that if you can do the thing based off your proficiency, you've got it right there. That's very relevant in a world where fumbles will happen a lot more. And I know a lot of players that will really enjoy this because sometimes at mid to high level play, having someone roll skill checks is kind of just rolling for the sake of rolling, or in my case, because I do house rule it, rolling for the sake of seeing if you hit a natural one and fall on your face, or seeing if you hit a natural 20 and find a thousand gold in the bag. I don't know why, you did an acrobatics check, congratulations. Though this also takes away the chance of getting a critical success, it means that you can't fumble and a lot of times it probably means that you can't fail. The other shared skill feats we see are mostly based on magic. For example, we see trick magic item, which allows you to use an item not meant for you think a fighter using a wand, as well as quick identification, which lets you identify magic items faster, depending on your proficiency rank, eventually requiring only three rounds of glancing at an item. We also see a shared skill feat based on the recall knowledge action, dubious knowledge, which gives you information even on a failed check, except some of it is accurate and some of it is wrong. That sounds fun. That sounds flavorful. That sounds like a really good way to get your party lost in the Darklands for a couple months, but I digress. Let's talk about scaling feats. Quote, You may have noticed that assurance scales based on your proficiency rank in the skill. In fact, many skill feats do, granting truly outstanding results at Legendary. The feat we see as an example of this is Catfall. Its feat level is 1, it requires us to be trained in acrobatics. Your cat-like aerial acrobatics allow you to cushion your fall. Treat all falls as if you fell 10 fewer feet. If you're an expert in acrobatics, treat falls as 25 feet shorter. If you're a master in acrobatics, treat them as 50 feet shorter. If you're legendary in acrobatics, you always land on your feet and don't take damage regardless of the distance of the fall. So jump off the Empire State Building, do a couple flips in the air, land on your feet, take a bow, and more importantly, 
don't die is what's happening here. That's really, really good, especially in a system where fall damage is not going to be a small handful of d6 that might, like, scratch your armor. No, it's 10 damage per 10 feet now. Man, this feat almost feels just super required for anybody who's trained in acrobatics. Because, again, even a 10-foot fall might do 10 damage to you, which is relevant. Also, that is super crazy. That's on the order of spellcaster power for someone who's trained in acrobatics, and anyone can be with the right skill feats. Holy crap. As we recover from this revelation, we'll note that a legendary performer can fascinate an unlimited number of people with a fascinating performance, which scales up from one person at the start. Also, you can jump off buildings and survive it. Yeah, I don't even... I guess I'm playing a bunch of rogues in Pathfinder 2nd Edition, or Rangers, or anyone who's trained in acrobatics. Good god. The next feat we see on the chopping block is Magical Crafting. Its feat level is 2. It requires us to be an expert in crafting. You can use the craft activity to create magic items in addition to mundane ones. Many magic items have special crafting requirements, such as access to certain spells as listed in the item entry in chapter 11. The blog notes that similarly, there's a skill feat to make alchemical items, and even one to create quick to build improvised traps. The first thing I'm seeing here is now it's not forge ring, craft arms and armor, craft wondrous item, a bunch of feats spread out all over the place. Now it's just the one. And this feat, of course, is probably a staple for the average adventuring party. Though item crafting is getting an overhaul, I imagine it still will be very strong. We end today's blog talking about legendary skills. Quote, Legendary characters can do all sorts of impressive things with their skills, not just using scaling skill feats, but also using inherently legendary skill feats. If you're legendary, you can swim like a fish, survive indefinitely in the void of space. What? Holy crap. Steal a suit of plate mail off a guard. Constantly sneak everywhere at full speed while performing other tasks. Give a speech that stops a war in the middle of the battlefield. Remove an affliction or permanent condition with a medical miracle. Speak to any creature with a language instantly through an instinctual pigeon language. Now that's P-I-D-G-I-N, not coo coo for the record. Completely change your appearance and costume in seconds. Squeeze through a hole the size of your head at your full walking speed. Decipher codes with only a skim and more what even is going on. This is what the casters are for, right? This is why we get magic items that give us compression if we think we're going to be having gigantic animal companions guilty as charged. To say nothing of... Skyrim and Fallout level pickpocketing, literally pulling the clothes off some dude's back. I don't know how to feel. This is really weird. I was really hoping, and it really did seem, that the disparity between the caster and the non-caster would close out in Pathfinder 2nd Edition, and yeah, it's gonna be skills that do it. Surviving in the void of space. What a strange and magical time to be alive. All right, let's talk about some feats. First, Legendary Impersonator. Its feat level is 15, and it looks like it requires not one, not two, but three actions. You need to be legendary in deception and quick disguise, so it looks like the disguise checks are rolling into deception, which only makes sense. You set up a full disguise with which you can impersonate someone with incredible speed. So in six seconds, snap your fingers, spin around, find a phone booth, whatever it is you need to do, now you're someone else. At feat level 15, when you're legendary in thievery and you have the pickpocket skill feat, with legendary thief, you can attempt to steal an object that is actively wielded or that would be extremely noticeable or time-consuming to remove, like worn shoes. <laughs> I don't, I'm sorry, I don't know how to feel about this. What even? Or armor. You must do so slowly and carefully, spending at least one minute and significantly longer for items that are normally time-consuming to remove, like the clothes on some dude's back. Throughout this duration, you must have some means of staying hidden, whether under cover of darkness or in a bustling crowd, for example, you take a minus five penalty to your thievery check, which I imagine by feat level 15 we can mitigate real easy. Even if you succeed, if the item is extremely prominent, again, like somebody's clothing that they're wearing right now, onlookers will quickly notice that it's gone after you steal it, but then you just hit that legendary impersonator and suddenly 
you're a kind priest of Saren Ray or Shaylin or, you know, not a legendary thief. I am beyond confused, beyond, can I say excited? Like, yeah, I suppose I'm excited. This just like, this is the stuff that casters are supposed to do. This is why we have a wizard to hold person the dude. And then if we just really need his clothes for some other reason than to, again, kill him and sell them to the first person who's willing to buy them, now we can just do that thing. And also jump off a dragon who's flying a mile in the air, land on our feet, take a polite bow, or, you know, fly that dragon into space. And space dragons do exist in Pathfinder and just hang out in the void of space. Doing space stuff. What do you guys think? Really, I, I don't even know what to think. Are we into this? Is this good? Do we like the fact that the right-hand side of the character sheet, assuming a similar loadout, can pull off this kind of stuff? Are we all suddenly digging out rogues? I'm playing a rogue. Yep, it's happening. Gonna play my elf barbarian. Gonna bring him back for a little while, but then we're gonna play some kind of rogue because wow. Also, I'm, yeah, are we still excited for Pathfinder 2nd Edition? I'm definitely real stoked for Pathfinder 2nd Edition, and I can't wait to see what my players can do with all these shenanigans in Doomsday Dawn, the first ever published bit of content for Pathfinder 2nd Edition, and hey, in case you haven't heard, you've got just under a month to follow this card right here to be directed to our giveaway. Six lucky winners will play Doomsday Dawn on Black Dragon Gaming. And of course, patronage at any tier grants you a second entry. If we can get patronage up to about 300 bucks a month, I'll let two groups do really crazy skill shenanigans in Doomsday Dawn. Somebody pinch me. Be sure to like and subscribe for more videos. Thanks for watching. The next episode of your Pathfinder 2nd Edition preview content drops next Tuesday.